Good afternoon and welcome. This is the last of three online Google Hangout sessions uh, this spring to support the Pittsburgh uh, workshops that are sponsored by the uh, Grable Foundation and in partnership with the Allegheny Intermediate Unit, um, as well as the Senator John Hines History Center, which is in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Today, I'm joined by two colleagues from the Freer Sackler Galleries in Washington, DC, Keith Wilson and Liz Eater. We'll leave you with a few classroom ready examples of ways that you can share this content with your students, as well as a more extensive list of resources to continue. I think you'll find that Keith and Liz have focused on specific objects with related maps and timelines to give a concise introduction to the topic. This session will be interactive, so please feel free to ask questions using the Q&A app. You can enable the Q&A app with the 3 by 3 grid in the top right, and you can click on Q&A and then ask questions, um, which we'll hopefully get to throughout the session. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Keith Wilson and Liz Eater. Hi, everybody. So I'm Liz Eater, and I'm the head of education at the Freer Gallery of Art and Arthur M. Sackler Gallery in Washington, D.C. Oh, and I'm Keith. <laughs> and Keith, you have kind of an interesting title that was on the title slide. You are the curator of ancient Chinese art. So could you tell uh, the teachers that we're working with today what ancient Chinese art is, since it's a very, very long uh, historical period? Yeah, for the Freer and Sackler, it means that basically I'm responsible for anything that was produced in China before the year 1000. Uh, today, our topic is going to be on the earlier end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, we thought that it might be interesting to um, raise questions relating to ancient China, uh, early civilization, so early writing, early social mm -hmm. organization, using objects in the Freer and Sackler that are closely related to pieces that have been uh, discovered archaeologically. And just to remind everybody, the Freer Gallery of Art and Arthur M. Sackler Gallery are one of the 19 units that make up the Smithsonian. We were the first art museum on the national, at, as part of the institution, and we're on the National Mall. We're the closest building to the castle, in case you've been there. And uh, we focus on the arts of Asia, and we also have a world-class collection of American art from the aesthetic movement in the 19th century. Yeah, those things were basically contemporaneous with the lifetime of Charles Freer, the founder of the Freer Gallery of Art. So from his point of view, those were contemporary, but he was also keenly interested in ancient objects from Asia. He saw a correspondence between them. Mm -hmm. Great. So we're going to focus now on uh, the key topics we're going to cover in the session today. We can have the next slide, Ashley. And the slide after that, I think. Right? Yeah, or, let's look at the key topics. Sorry, Ben. Yeah, there we go. go. Great. So, when did modern archaeology begin in China? And uh, you could tell us a little bit about the key topics here. Um, well, first of all, the, the, the key importance of archaeology in studying an ancient culture is without scientific documentation of artifacts from the past, we really don't know what they are and how old they are. Mm -hmm. So that's why the creation and practice of the social science, and it is a science of archeology, span was so critical to the understanding of the study of mm -hmm. sociology, human history, technical history, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. Uh, in the big international picture, archaeology in the contemporary sense, that is the scientific sense of practice, not just finding things buried in the ground, but um, recording the context of discovery and making sure that the relationships between objects in their physical um, locations during excavation uh, are recorded and uh, thereby facilitating comparisons of, of different contexts of like objects and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, that came to China relatively late. 
Uh, and the Smithsonian actually played a key role in the advent of contemporary archaeology in China. Um, the Smithsonian sponsored the first two seasons of um, archaeological excavations in China in 1928 and 1929. And so today we're going to be focusing on work at a particular site which was the last capital of the Shang Dynasty, circa 1300 to 1050 BCE. The site of this was the city of Anyang. And we're gonna use that as a lens for looking at how we understand and study what Keith is calling here in quotes, heirloom objects, and he'll explain what that means. And we're gonna see how all of this uh, plays a role in our understanding of modern Chinese archaeology. So we'll be using as a case study the tomb of one particular individual and we will be learning about what that tomb tells us and how Keith has used that in his practice as a curator at the museum to discover and make comparisons with the objects from that tomb and tombs in our collection. Great and um one reason why the site and this tomb in particular um, has added significance for us is um, those two seasons of excavation sponsored by the Smithsonian in 1928 and 1929 were at Anyang. So our connection with Chinese archaeology really goes back to its beginnings. Uh, and this is something that we're, we're very proud of. Uh, I should say, uh, in connection to that, that uh, the site of Anyang has been under essentially continuous excavation since 1928. Mm -hmm. So it is uh, really a paradigmatic site showing um, the ongoing importance of archaeology as an academic practice in understanding the past. Let's look at the next slide, the kind of places, um, the Chinese Bronze Age and the Fu Hao tomb and the Anyang period, late Shang Dynasty, in a kind of broader historical perspective. Yeah, this is really a great slide because um, how do we really know about life in ancient China? Because when I look at this and I think about, you know, unlike the peoples of ancient Egypt who left behind pyramids and temples, for example, the ancient Chinese didn't really build any monumental structures out of um, non-perishable materials like stone. So when I looked at this timeline, I thought it was really interesting. Mm. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, in terms of above ground um, construction, if, if any of you have been to China and been to say the Forbidden City, you know it's basically a wooden architecture tradition. Mm -hmm. Uh, the only non-perishable materials that survive from prehistoric and early historic China tend to be like the column bases, which are often just um, flat rocks that are still located where they were um, millennia ago at the base of wooden columns that supported a wooden superstructure. Uh, maybe with clay tiles, the clay tiles may survive in, in the form of fragments, but the superstructure, the wooden framework, um, is essentially completely gone. So uh, unfortunately, we don't have that impressive uh, above ground physical presence that you have with, say, ancient Egypt or um, the Sasanians in Iran or the um, Greco-Roman world. Uh, I will say, however, that what we do have from the Chinese archaeological context is incredible really subterranean. Cool. <laughs> uh, really <remains>. cool stuff. <laughs> and maybe Ashley, you want to skip ahead two slides? There's a pretty awesome picture of a Chinese tomb that will just kind of give people, yeah, keep going there, give you a sense of the scale of some of these subterranean tombs. What you're looking at here is one of the tombs that was discovered at the Anyang site. Uh, and you can see the little people down there um, at the, on the floor of the tomb. Mm -hmm. So this is about um, nine or 10 stories subterranean. And you're looking at 
the uh, walls that were actually excavated in, say, the year 1250 BCE for the construction of the tomb. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, very little of this, maybe fragments of the above ground memorial mound that would have been part of the tomb structure would remain, but you know, it's an earthen work, and so it, it's not nearly as impressive as. Um, the remains in, as I say, Egypt or, or other cultures where they have a massive above ground uh, masonry construction mm -hmm. tradition. But I think the timeline in the slide that we just looked at, if we can go back to it for just a second, is going to be really valuable. One, Again, one more, I think. Or, yeah. Go. So this, this slide kind of puts or situates the period that we're focusing on in the broader history. So for those of you that teach world civilizations, which I know is a, many of you who are listening today, can kind of look at that and, and think about the other periods that you may teach with your students and use some objects as a way of teaching about the, you know, using this for visual culture and, and for thinking about how to tell the broader story. Yeah, just incidentally, one of the connections I found really interesting was, uh, I'm sorry, this, the writing on this is so tiny, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, about two-thirds of the way down, um, in circa two, uh, 1225, Moses leads the Exodus, and Moses receives the Ten Commandments. This is at about the same time as the tomb that we'll be looking at today. Uh, in the, the Chinese uh, scheme of things, this is classified as early Bronze Age. Uh, the Bronze Age in China keeps moving earlier and earlier in terms of its origins. Now it's mm -hmm. clocked at about 1800 BCE. Mm -hmm. uh, it may well be going earlier with um, the uh, ambitious work of archeologists there finding more and more earlier and earlier remains that allow us to date things earlier and earlier. Um, the Bronze Age in China lasts essentially from 1800 BCE to 200, let's say, BCE. Mm -hmm. uh, the Shang Dynasty, which is the first uh, historic dynasty, that is the first historical period that has documents remaining from it, uh, is given the circa dates of 1600 to 1050 BCE. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at the really essentially the last third or so of this dynasty when their capital was at Anyang, as, as, um, as Liz said earlier. So we can look at the next slide then to see where Anyang is in the map because it's the capital before this was just below it, right? In yes, yeah, southwest at our, um, Zhengzhou and Arlito mm -hmm. are two earlier Shang Dynasty settlements. Um, all of these are along the Yellow River, so Really, when um, people talk about um, early Chinese history, uh, emphasis has been placed on the Yellow River because that is where many of the earliest historical mm -hmm. settlements have been located. But we're also finding more and more um, Neolithic, that is Stone Age uh, cultures, very rich in their material remains, are now being excavated uh, along the Yangtze further mm -hmm. south. Um, the Yangtze, of course, empties into the, uh, into the ocean at Shanghai. So you really have these two great uh, river systems in China that are promoting early um, human and material development uh, in China. Mm -hmm. Today we'll be focusing on the Yellow River because that's where um, the first historical sites are. Okay, so let's look now um, did you want to mention something? Well, we you kind of covered a little bit about the Anyang and archaeology. Did you want to say anything more about that? Um, just a couple of key dates in mm -hmm. Chinese history for everybody to remember. Um, you know, there was a, an imperial family ruling China until 1912, uh, which was replaced by the First Republic, which kind of opened China up to um, Western academic practices, and, and I think that may be one explanation on why it took a while for um, the practice of archaeology to take root in China. The first archaeologists were educated in the U.S., um, chiefly at Harvard, and as I've already mentioned, the Smithsonian and the uh, staff member of the Freer Gallery of Art played 
really a, a critical role in uh, promoting archaeology and archaeological practice in China. You can see him there in that slide. That's Carl Bishop, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. I wish I had his job. He was uh, appointed and within a year was sent to China and stayed there for eight years to uh, promote the practice of archaeology and um, historical, modern uh, historical studies in China. And his papers are in our archives. Right. And those can be accessed online. What really attracted attention to the Anyang site, beginning with um, Wang Yirong, who's in the upper left of that slide, was um, the discovery of what was um, presumed to be the earliest surviving ancient writing in China. And as history teachers, you all know that historical documents really constitute civilization mm -hmm. and uh, are an important uh, marker for a, a great epic in, in the development of, of human uh, life. Mm -hmm. And so those so-called oracle bones uh, became kind of a touchstone for the advent of, of Chinese history. Uh, with the excavation of the site, a much broader range of incised inscriptions that date to this period, 1300 to 1050 BCE, have been found. And as a result, we have um, a much, much clearer understanding of this period of, of ancient China. Mm -hmm. Great. So in the, in the next slide, uh, this is a, a really uh, so interesting when um, Keith and I were talking about this, the ways that uh, we can understand the study of uh, settlement sites and human remains and oral and inscribed artifacts. And uh, what we actually can tell from the inscriptions on uh, some of the objects that were found in various archaeological sites at Anyang. Yeah, one, one of the big breakthroughs came with the oracle bones because they are the transcription of essentially um, events where the Shang King would ask questions or divine um, through communication with his deceased ancestors, so earlier kings in the royal line. Uh, those presumably were very solemn ceremonies. They involved um, the application of uh, heated, probably metal uh, pokers to turtle shells and ox shoulder blades. Don't yeah. ask me why they chose those mm -hmm. as the medium for this communication but they were critical in, um, in the communication and based on the way that those shells or bones cracked with the application of the heat, uh, diviners would read the answer as a yes or no. So when you look at these inscribed shells and bones, the question is usually asked in positive and negative. Um, the king will recover from his toothache, the king will not recover right. from his toothache, and then the divination ceremony would result in hopefully a positive answer on the one and a negative answer on the other, i.e. they would both be answered in the same way, yes, the king will recover. Yeah, it's interesting that the Shang kings, from what we know on, on some of these oracle bones, ask about everything from the weather to the outcome of births and battles and hunts and all sorts of stuff. And just uh, as a reminder, it's the top three slides here on the top line that are the oracle bones that Keith is referring to. And I just wanted to point out, since one of the resources that we'll be talking about later is something called OpenFS, and it's our digitized collection, that each one of the slides here, which you can access later, when you go back and kind of think about the presentation, has what's known as an accession number. And that number actually, an S refers to Sackler, an F refers to Freer. It tells the date that it came into the collection. So F1985.35, it came into the collection in 1985, the 35th object in the collection. But what's important for you to know is that that's the number that you would use to look anything up in our digitized collection so that you can find out more about any of the objects that Keith and I are talking about today. Yeah, and see super zoomable images. Um, I realize that what you're looking at now is kind mm -hmm. of tiny and hard to read, especially with 
something like this with this spidery writing, you probably can't even see it. Right. But on OpenFS, you're able to zoom in um, really, really closely and see the the written words, which is pretty amazing because they're all pictographs and you know they're right super. And right before we went online, um, Keith and I had an interesting discussion about the actual writing that's on the oracle bones. Do you want to say something about that? Yeah, it's uh, ancestral to contemporary Chinese. So unlike say hieroglyphs that have no connection to say modern Arabic that's the lingua franca in Egypt, um, the oracle bone script and bronze inscriptions like you see um, the two vessels below the bones, mm -hmm. that is uh, ancestral to contemporary Chinese characters. Mm -hmm. Many of them are directly related to surviving mm -hmm. characters and you can line them up side by side. Uh, a college grad living in China today probably could not read an oracle bone or a bronze inscription. It's, it's an acquired it's skill, yeah. but um, with a little bit of training, even someone like me, who is a non-native speaker of Chinese, can read uh, inscribed oracle bones and, and bronzes. But what I, I, a couple of things I wanted to point out here with these artifacts, especially for those interested in writing, uh, a couple of things were, were really important. One was the king names that appeared on the oracle bones mm -hmm. unbelievably corresponded with the king list that had been uh, preserved in transmitted historical Chinese texts that had survived for 3,000 years, passed on um, through um, probably handwritten manuscripts until the advent of printing uh, around the dawn of uh, common era. So um, it was startling to be able to believe in the king list and this transmitted traditional historical picture of China and find proof in these living documents from the time period. The other thing I'll say is this question of uh, asking, posing the oracle in a positive and negative from my point of view as an art historian kind of um, suggests an interest in symmetry, basically a symmetrical orientation with a positive and a negative, a right and a left. And I, for me, that helps me understand why so many um, Chinese objects, Chinese designs are um, organized around the idea of the central axis with the right and the left half matching one another. Well, that's really interesting. I wonder when we look at the next slide, if that also applies to the way the tomb is set up in this particular image. Yeah, so what we're looking at now is really the, the core of the content for today. And uh, I'll give a little bit of background here. Okay. Uh, so the capital was moved to Anyang around the year 1300, maybe 1275. None of these dates are absolute. They're all kind of relative. Um, and uh, this was a case in point where all of a sudden a discovery was made that had inscribed objects and lo and behold those inscribed objects corresponded to names that had been preserved in transmitted historical literature. Uh, the name that appears on an overwhelming number of the huge number of inscribed bronzes in this tomb is Fu Hao, which literally means consort Hao, so it's a female tomb. Okay. It is the only so far discovered basically unlooted tomb from the Anyang period. Uh, even that ginormous, very deep grave that we looked at uh, about 10 minutes ago, when uh, it had been cleared it was um, discovered that uh, looters had tunneled into that tomb probably shortly after the fall of the Anyang period uh, and taken away many of the precious objects that had been buried there. What makes the tomb that you're looking at now on the screen so incredible is that it is uh, the burial of an of a very important person. So we're looking at the very we're looking at the one percenter. Mm -hmm. and uh, the kind of ritual that would have surrounded her both in life and death. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that it's a female's tomb. 
uh, and the fact that we we know about her, this mm -hmm. Fu Hao. Uh, Fu Hao appears in Oracle Bones as well as the transmitted histories uh, as the consort of King Wu Ding, who was one of the first Shang kings to rule from Anyang. Mm -hmm. And we know from the Oracle Bones that the king was concerned about a lot of things relating to Fu Hao. So we have his divin divinations that concerned her and her life. Uh, childbirth. It also turns out that she was a general and yeah. she led troops into battle. Uh, there yeah. were many questions asked about the success of her campaigns. She hunted. Uh, the king was curious about whether she would be successful in hunts or not. Uh, so combining all of these different pieces of evidence, historical texts, oracle bones, and now in this case, uh, a richly furnished tomb that has survived to us, really begin to help us understand life in this period uh, with a kind of um, scientific basis so that uh, we can generally feel pretty positive that our understandings are, are based on, on fact, on reality. Uh, if we look at the tomb layout here, what you're looking at is a, a recreation on the right. The, the real tomb, of course, was um, excavated, the objects were removed, conserved, and are now in uh, climate-controlled exhibition facilities. Some of them are in Beijing, some of them are at a site museum at Anyang, and others uh, are on loan uh, to various Chinese museums. Many of them have traveled to the US many times. Some of you may even have seen some of the objects from this tomb. Uh, it was unveiled for the first time in New York in the Great Bronze Age of China show at the Metropolitan in 1980, if any of you uh, happen to have seen that show. So that was only a four years after the tomb was discovered or rediscovered, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, this was um, a landmark in the practice of archaeology in China. If, if, just to take a step back, uh, remembering that the Cultural Revolution in China lasted from the mid-60s to the, almost the mid-70s, a period when essentially academic life came to an end. Uh, it took several years after the conclusion of the Cultural Revolution for the academic institutions and uh, learned societies and everything else to get up and running again. So this was one of the first post-cultural revolution major discoveries. And yeah, you're right, getting the monograph out in three or four years was, was important. Amazing, because there's over a thousand, there were over a thousand objects in the tomb now. Right. Yeah, some bronze, some jade, um, some, some were weapons, some were uh, ritual objects, so, and many of them were inscribed with her name, so it's pretty cool. What you're looking at here, she would have been laid out in the center of the tomb, and the diagram that's on the left, uh, and here north is uh, oriented at the top. I took the picture on the right, and I couldn't quite get myself to the right place to be able to take that from truth south looking true <laughs> north, but you, you're kind of, uh, you're in the uh, southeast corner of the tomb looking to the northwest. Okay. And you can begin to line objects up. If you see in the tomb photograph, there's that vessel that has three buckets on top in the upper right. You can line that up with uh, a similar okay. kind of construction in the upper right corner of the tomb diagram mm -hmm. next to it. Yeah. In the center there is where the body would have been laid out. And so she was literally surrounded by these um, bronze containers. These were made not probably for burial expressly, but would have been used during her lifetime uh, in uh, banquets dedicated to her deceased ancestors and those of her husband, the king. Uh, because they were so important, the practice of that ancestor rite was so important above ground, it's believed that uh, to sustain that ritual practice, often these ritual vessels would then be buried with the deceased so that in a kind of conceptual way, the rite would continue um, in the grave. Mm 
uh, in death. So it's not so dissimilar to what was the practice in ancient Egypt. No. So um, that that would explain why certain types of objects were selected to be put in graves. Then. Right, mm -hmm. and um, what I find particularly interesting is right around where she was buried. Uh, it's a you have to kind of take my word for it. In the um, photograph of the tomb, you'll see there's what look like clumps of stuff um, sort of near nearer to the center of the burial. Those are um, essentially the jades and other personal objects, small things that would have mm -hmm. been personal objects for her, mm -hmm. things that she used in her everyday life, luxuries that she would have used for adornment or for makeup or um, what have you. Uh, but with the collapse of the tomb, what, what this photograph is showing is those kinds of things get sort of stuck together with the, the, the dirt of the tomb in a more uh, aggressive way than, than the bronze vessels. Mm -hmm. The other thing I wanted to point out was uh, there are a couple of ritual burials that accompanied her. You can see this in the diagram on the left. Mm -hmm. uh, on the right and left side of the, the chamber, there are raised shelves that you can also see in the, um, the tomb photo. These, uh, again, probably relate to the burial of uh, servants so that life can continue on or service can continue on to this noble woman um, in death. Uh, it's not uh, very often in China that you get the burial of lots and lots of um, servant figures, like uh, is often mm -hmm. the case in Western Asia and Egypt. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it, is, uh, it is the case here. And I read somewhere that she also had dogs buried in there. Yeah, it's... Um, For those of us who love our pets, I wonder <laughs> what the relationship was. It really made her human to me. Dogs were protective. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're yeah. often buried directly below the body in a mm -hmm. separate pit. Mm -hmm. um, so the, um, underneath the body of the human is, is um, the mm -hmm. body of their dog or dogs. Yeah. I know Keith is a dog lover, so I thought I'd just <laughs> mention that for, the, for those of us that think about that. So there was a question, look, too, yeah, actually, great. from the audience um, that, you know, had to do with specifically with this tomb. So just a reminder to folks that if you have questions, too, you can use the Q&A app on the right-hand side, just mm -hmm. like Tess did. Um, but Tess's question is really very, very much related to what you were just talking about, about the significance of the types of objects mm -hmm. that were placed in her tomb. Right. And in fact, it's a great question to ask because in the next few slides, Keith is going to be talking about the significance of the types of objects, not only in this tomb, but how that helps us to understand more about ancient China today. Would that be a good time to, Let, to move on, or do you want to continue? Maybe a little bit here first okay. before we move on to the, right. the objects themselves. Um, first of all, the... Uh, typologically speaking, what kinds of um, mm -hmm. the bronzes in particular do we find in the tomb? They are fairly evenly split between um, objects that were made for the preparation, service, and consumption of food mm -hmm. and wine. And wine right. So um, we find cauldrons, both round and square cauldrons, typically with legs that would have allowed them to be placed directly on flames. And I think you can see some of those, look yeah. up in the upper left-hand corner of the mm -hmm. photograph. Mm -hmm. You can see a couple of cauldrons standing there um, on their legs. Uh, that um, vessel in the right-hand corner with the three buckets on it um, is actually a, a grain steamer. So that's, that's basically a Bronze Age rice cooker. <laughs> there you uh, go. You could have placed um, uh, water underneath. There are vents in the bottom of those three buckets that would have um, been filled with uh, grain. The vents in the bottom would have allowed the rising steam to um, heat and cook the grain that was inside. The lids must have been made out of wood because no um, grain steamers in ancient China have survived with a lid. So we just assume yeah. that they would have been covered with a, a wooden yeah. lid or a cloth lid or something like huh. that. So we do begin to get a sense of um, the kind of, first of all, the kind of food that people were eating. Mm -hmm. 
and the ennobling of that kind of food for the offering to deceased ancestors. Um, in addition to the food, um, there are wine containers, and it's not just wine um, buckets for, for saving the wine, but there are also heaters and cups so that we know that um, the kind of alcohol, and it probably was a, a, a grain-based, almost more like a mead or a beer or a sake almost, an unrefined sake that would have been uh, the primary alcoholic beverage at this time. So these kinds of vessels would have been used to essentially prepare the same diet that the people would have been consuming themselves for symbolic offerings to deceased ancestors. The oracle bones um, suggest to us that after the symbolic banquet that the um, officiant and those in attendance would consume the, the food and wine themselves and uh, kind of, kind of, oops, uh, it would have been needed for Fu Hao to conduct this kind of a ritual. One other question I had too, I noticed in the top left you noted um, a Wikipedia link and as a former teacher sometimes we're a little cautious about using Wikipedia but I know that you mentioned a lot of researchers have provided information um, for Wikipedia so it's, it's getting better and better. Good, uh, and good. I looked at, I looked at this um, entry just to be sure before giving it to you and it, it actually it's pretty skeletal but what's there is um, reliable. Mm -hmm. Great. This, you know, the problem here, as with a lot of Chinese material, is a lot of it is just available in Chinese. It's getting better and better. More things are being um, uh, written in, in Chinese, both in China and in the West. So um, there's a developing um, very handy bibliography on the subject of Fu Hao, because this tomb is so important. So you should be able to find um, good things online. If you find anything that has been produced by the Ch uh, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, that is very reliable. That is essentially their Institute of Archaeology. Mm -hmm. The other thing I wanted to point out, though, before we leave this slide, you don't really get a sense of scale here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I forgot to jot down um, the exact weight of um, bronze that was buried in this tomb, but my memory is it's in the neighborhood of two and a half tons. Uh, wow. The vessels that you're looking at in this tomb are enormous. Um, the largest of the cauldrons so is like about, this. yeah, it's, it's big enough to uh, wash a pretty large baby. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. And so uh, clearly at the aristocratic, at the high end of the aristocratic, uh, um, end of society, not only do you get lots and lots of objects, but you get um, objects of enormous scale. Mm -hmm. All of these vessels were cast, and cast is not, casting is not necessarily a very efficient use of metal. Uh, each of these vessels is probably weighing at least 10 pounds, and that's how you get to that um, huge combined right. weight. Well, that's actually a great uh, opportunity to mention this uh, publication, which is the Art and Archaeology of Ancient China Teacher's Guide, which, although written over a decade ago, still has some incredibly valuable information. There's some information in here on bronze casting, and in the resources link that we'll be looking at later, or just pointing out to you, there's also something on our website about bronze casting, because this is done in a piecemeal technique, and it's unlike, um, any. unlike any other type of bronze casting that you might be familiar with. And also we have a reference there to jades, although um, uh, Keith will be showing you some uh, objects there. We often talk about jade carving, but jade in fact is more than one type of mineral and they were not carved. Mm -hmm. They were done through an abrasion process. So again, some more information about the techniques and materials can be found in some of the resources that we'll be providing. And before we open it up, I'm, I'm cognizant of the time, maybe just running through a few slides where uh, I've chosen objects from our collection and put them side by side with things from the Fuha tomb mm -hmm. because in a museum setting, uh, at the outset, Liz mentioned, you know, we, we deal with heirloom objects. What does that mean? Heirloom objects are things that mm -hmm. have come from an unknown 
burial context, I don't know where any of these things were excavated. I don't know what they might have been found with. So first of all, to provide a date for an object, I need to find a comparison piece. Mm -hmm. And I need to find a comparison piece that comes from a datable context. That context not only provides a date, but then as we were just looking at with Fu Hao's tomb, begins to fill out a much richer story about how these things were used, who would have owned them, how they were made, what, why they would have been buried in the first place. So uh, we felt that looking at that one tomb and then looking back at objects that are on display in our museum and others um, helps to create a connection between uh, a museum and an archaeological site today mm -hmm. and the early Bronze Age. Mm -hmm. So here's one case in point where the object on the right is in the Freer collection acquired in 1935 as you can tell from the accession number in the lower right hand corner as Liz was saying. Uh, so this if you wanted to look at it in OpenFS you would type F1935.12 into the query box and it would take you to uh, the caption information and a photograph, a zoomable photograph of the object that would allow you to see just how amazing the surface decoration is on this. Yeah, these are really great to use in the classroom if you have a whiteboard or some way of projecting because you can really, really see the detail. And one of the things that makes the bronzes so interesting is the patterns and the decorations on them. We're not really focusing right now on the decorations, but in some of the resources, you can see that many of them have these mythical animals. We're not exactly sure of what the design may mean, but it's um, very, in some of these are very intricate. What's that actually in the center here on the object on the right? Um, so what we're, we're looking at a square wine warmer. You know it's a warmer because it's got legs, so it was designed to be put on a fire so the contents could be warm. It's lidded so that the, mm -hmm. the warmed wine would have stayed warm a little bit longer. So we can use it's that got, to pick it up. But. It's got one, <laughs> one handle on the front, which mm -hmm. you may not be able to tell from this mm -hmm. vantage mm -hmm. point, and then yeah. the lid has a handle on top. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm comparing it to, on the left, um, a similar shaped object that came from the Fuha tomb we've just been looking at. Um, I was puzzled by this comparison because uh, in terms of form <laughs> and decoration, the freer piece on the right is a little bit more advanced than the piece on the left. But uh, traditionally, our other archaeological finds had made us believe that the freer piece came from the same time period as Fu Hao. Huh. So I've been trying to figure out why, and uh, currently this is my working hypothesis. The Fu Hao piece on the left uh, does not have an inscription, so we don't know for sure that this was made for her or was used by her. And it was, it was found. In her tomb. It was found in her tomb mm -hmm. as a singleton, not as a pair. Whereas uh -huh. many of the objects in uh -huh. her tomb were created as pairs or sets. Mm -hmm. So that has made me think that this may have been an addition to the vessels that she had made for herself or that were made for her. This could have been a supplementary object that may have been old when it was put into her tomb. So it raises that point that um, even though a tomb provides a context, we can't always assume that everything in that tomb comes from the same time period or was made especially for that particular context. We have to weigh that archaeological information carefully uh, and in comparison with, with other archaeological finds. And could you just describe for uh, our audience what you mean by advanced when you describe the piece on the right from the Freer that you said it was slightly more advanced? Well, look at the shape. It has this really nice, sharply articulated silhouette, a little bit more advanced than the piece on the left, where there's clearly, you know, kind of a, an upper neck, which is inverted. It comes down to a kind of bulging body below, again, constricted, and then the legs. The silhouette on the freer piece has a, has a much cleaner, more continuous flow from the rim all the way down to the feet. 
Uh, it's emphasized by those projections at the four corners that kind of add a, mm -hmm. almost an architectural strength to mm -hmm. the shape. And the decoration is in high relief, whereas uh, on, the piece, uh, in the, on the piece on the left, uh, it's uh, not raised in high relief. So all of those things suggest to me that our piece is a little bit uh, newer. More fully developed. More so fully developed than the piece on, on the left and corresponds mm -hmm. to other objects mm -hmm. that were found in the Fu Hao tomb. So I think this um, Fu Hao object on the, the left is a little bit of an anomaly and may have been an heirloom object even mm -hmm. for her. Yeah, thanks. That's a good, that's a, that's a great description. Now the next comparison, uh, we're looking at a miniature marble. I didn't put the dimension in here, I should have. The vessel on the right, which is in the Freer collection, is about two and a quarter inches tall. The huh. previous one was about 24 inches tall. Mm -hmm. uh, it was unclear. We didn't know how to date this. We didn't know what it was made for. We thought it was Chinese and ancient. We didn't really know. Um, we couldn't really find out much more about it. We couldn't really find useful comparisons. But in the Fu Hao tomb, there was a similar miniature marble vessel. I'm showing that on the, the left here that has a very similar contour. We still don't know what miniature marble vessels were used for, mm -hmm. but at least it helped give me a context for the piece that we have in the collection. And was marble an indigenous stone in that area? Or would it have had to have been in Cordis? Uh, there are rich sources for marble <laughs> okay. in, in Northeast China, although it's rare to find marble being used this early. Yeah, it's, I was gonna say, it seems like a mystery to me. <laughs> it's much more common among uh, in the Buddhist period, so that's after the first century CE where you get mm -hmm. um, religious sculpture that's being made at all. And then on the next slide, there's some really interesting, as you call them, very personal objects. Uh, yeah, these Tell are like uh, these. early Bronze Age Q-tips, and it, <laughs> it just, it, uh, working with objects like this is almost the most immediate and the closest bond you can have with um, an early person. I mean, these are things that would have been used um, nearly daily by them, and they would have been handled and kept um, kept uh, close at hand, so that um, I, I just, it, it really personalizes what I, what I study. A lot of people think mm -hmm. that I study dead anonymous people, but um, <laughs> it's at moments like this where I feel uh, a real like that connection. Connection, exactly. Yeah. Across the millennia. And I also <laughs> like them because they're these... Ancient China. Exactly. Yeah. Um, there are these um, little miniature um, representational sculptures too, very naturalistically inspired. And we don't normally think of early China, Chinese artists as being so directly inspired by natural forms, mm -hmm. but these personal objects that would have been handled um, kind of be, betray that. And you know, obviously people were interested in depicting the world around them. Mm -hmm. So the one on the left that's in our collection, how big is that? That's only about um, three and a half, four inches tall. Mm -hmm. And it's made out of bone. That's we, bone. So has that been tested? Do we know what kind of animal it's from? Is it um, Generally things are being made out of uh, cow bone. Okay, so similar to the, the oracle, uh, oracle bones. bones. Okay. There's also right. uh, a quick question. Um, do we know if there's actually any cultural significance behind the animals that are chosen in these designs? So it looks like one might be, is it a turtle perhaps? Mm -hmm. um, so are there any significance that you know of as far as culturally? Um, the difficulty with uh, assigning uh, cultural meaning to the different animals is um, beginning with written documents of the period first, because those are the closest related historical documents we have to the objects themselves. Unlike what um, often happens is people use much more recent Chinese associations of animals with directions or mm -hmm. with um, horoscopes or mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, so I think I would say um, we can say, unfortunately, we can't say as much about the associations mm -hmm. as we might like because I don't think we should use 
um, interpretations that are um, that far from removed the time period. from the time yeah. period. Sure. It's a good question. But okay. um, we do find all of these turtles, birds, um, tigers, or whatever that little creature is, <laughs> um, appearing also amongst the decoration on the ritual vessels. So yeah. it, it's not just in the in the medium of bone that, that we're finding this interest. Uh, also, you can see that um, certain animals are uh, depicted in profile. Uh, from again, from an art historical point of view, there seems to be uh, a sorting process where certain animals are, are typically shown frontally or from above; others are shown in profile, mm -hmm. and that continues. Um, no matter whether they're shown as freestanding elements like this or in bronze decor. And I think there's, like if you could see the cover of this resource guide, which is a features an object from our collection, there's no mistaking what animal this is, and this is actually a bronze vessel. So huh. it's uh, really fascinating how these animals have been used both for the actual shape, for the decoration, but again, because we don't have the written documentation or any inscriptions from the archaeological yeah. record, we really don't know. Maybe just a couple of very brief words about the last two slides before we open things up. I realize we've mm -hmm. already exceeded our time. Yeah, this has been great, though, being able to kind of compare artifacts in the Fur Sackler collection with other artifacts. So it's great. As a person interested in ancient jade, what, what really interests me about the Fuha tomb is that there were hundreds of jades in her tomb, and many of them were over a thousand years old when she died. Wow. So she obviously was a collector. She was a collector too, yeah. And so it, it's again uh, one of those aha moments where you can actually talk about a personality of mm. an historical person, uh, and 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 have some kind of real substance in the way that that you talk about their character and interests. And last but not least, the uh, the next slide. Um, you know, China is catching up with their capability for technical analysis of artifacts, but uh, at the museum, we've had a lab since the early 50s, and we've been doing a lot of work on kind of the heirloom objects in our collection, trying to understand how they were made, how they were decorated, how they aged, and how they were cleaned. Uh, and so this is a body of material that now kind of helps to enrich the archaeological record, because these are objects from similar context to the ones that are coming out of the ground in China today. And we can help advise our Chinese colleagues on best practice in terms of the, the study and care of these artifacts. Mm -hmm. That's great. So the final slide that we have uh, is a resources uh, page that uh, brings to light many of the resources that we talked about today. All the resources listed here are from the Freer and Sackler. And at the very, very bottom of the page, you can see where we talk, where the URL for the OpenFS. There's a user's guide there in case you want to uh, use it uh, in your classroom. So it's a little bit more specific. The China history timeline is very interesting. This booklet that I've been showing you is available for free in these three. PDFs, uh, the other sites on ancient Chinese jades broadcasting, and uh, the bronzes in general are there. Uh, Keith is working on a project which we'll be launching shortly mm. about our ancient jades collection, a catalog, so we can add that to the learning lab that we are uh, putting together for you, of which uh, there's something there now and we'll be enriching. So if we could go to the next slide, are there any questions for us? Oh, that's, that's sure. the learning so, lab collection. Uh, one, of the, one of our colleagues at mm -hmm. the Smithsonian Center for Learning and Digital Access put together just some of the resources that are um, available that were mentioned earlier today. So you can see um, you know, the, the jades um, as, as well mm -hmm. as um, some of the artifacts, the oracle bones, um, as well as an archive to this session. So um, if you want to just show a certain portion to your students, Students or go back and make sure you got all the information correctly, um, you can go to this Learning Lab collection and we'll be posting that in the Google comments as well. 
so we can open up the floor and see if there's any other questions from anybody that might be out there today on this uh, it's a nice day here in, in Washington, D.C. Absolutely. And Linda says those are terrific resources for teachers. I personally especially liked that you used a lot of compare and contrast strategies to start to kind of unravel this mystery that might be pretty interesting to, to students. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to mention that we have an incredible exhibition that's on view right now at the museum that features an object that we call the Cosmic Buddha. And there are some online resources available for that as well. So um, we have a lot going on at the museum, a lot of resources available for educators and it, individuals interested in not only the arts of ancient China, but in all of the areas that our museum collects. So. And we're trying to do more and more online. Mm -hmm. So that we can reach our national audience. For those of you that aren't able to come in and visit the museum itself, you may know that the Freer Gallery of Art is closed right now for 18 months for a major renovation due to working on the heating and air conditioning, but will be reopening. And uh, Keith and some of the other curators have been very hard at work thinking about the interpretation and the display of the collections that are in their care. And you'll come to the museum if you have the opportunity to come to Washington, D.C. and see some newly, um, I don't know what we would say, but interpreted or yeah, re 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 rethought displays that uh, might reflect current practices. So this very small case study that we worked on today gives you a little bit of sense of, of the practice of curation, the, the study of objects, how we, can, how we use objects to think about the broader context of history uh, across the globe, and uh, we hope that it's been informative and useful. Absolutely. I think there's actually two questions from the audience now. Um, okay. One of which is, how were they able to determine the age of the different jade pieces? Well, um, it, interesting question. I, I mentioned um, that Fu Hao was a collector. Mm -hmm. And earlier in my discussion, I, I mentioned that you have to be really cautious about how you use archaeological information. Mm -hmm. When uh, the Fu Hao tomb was first published, mm -hmm the objects that we now identify as being much older than the tomb itself, those objects that were probably a thousand years old or older when she died, were not cataloged that way. They were cataloged as if they were produced for her mm -hmm. in, uh, yeah. in the late Shang exactly. period. So um, the question of how we date things is really at the core of our professional practice and and the museum, as well as for the archaeologists, it really uh, the the primary way that that we have um, created a it's really almost a matrix is uh, by cr creating object based typologies, and those are based on hundreds or thousands of tombs. Sure. So we know in this culture, in this period, this is what and in this a dish place. In, in this place, <laughs> yeah. this is what a bowl should look like. Uh -huh. Uh, this is what a cauldron should look like. And by choosing something as common as everyday cooking wares, it establishes a pretty broad-based standard for different periods, cultures, and places. And using that then as the basis to date other artifacts that are found with them. That is the standard and most broadly uh, applied practice for dating tomb contexts. And so that's where if, if you come up with a tomb that by these standards should um, date to the year 1000 and the artifacts should look like A, B, and C, but you don't have A, B, and C in there, then you have to look very closely at what's there and see if those are older or if those are imports or if they are outside the expe expected norm. Um, the more scientific approach, which is, uh, in fact, very rarely applied um, because uh, it requires um, finding organic material uh, in proximity with other kinds of objects, is carbon-14 dating. 
you can't actually date through analysis directly a piece of jade, but you can, if you find a piece of jade next to a piece of charcoal, date the charcoal, which may help give you a date for the jade or whatever else might be found with it. But again, you have to approach those results with caution. Yeah, and I think Amy's question is a good one because when Keith and I were discussing um, how to approach this session, and he brought up that idea of heirloom objects. Most folks think that museums acquire objects with a provenance from a collector who knows it came from Anyang in you know, 1600 BCE, and that's actually rarely the case. Yeah, we have to build the history for objects. Mm -hmm. Wow. So it's a, a little, I think it's a little known fact that the research component of a curator's work and, and uh, we who work in education as well, have to really be careful about determining the dates and the age and the types and such of the objects that are in our care. So it's a good question. And, you know, all the interpretation about function, mm -hmm. fabrication are typically based on date. And so you, you have to be sure that you've got the date right before right. you start interpreting it. Right. And I think what's really fascinating is when I went to undergrad and I studied the art and archaeology of ancient China, that was a while ago. And uh, as Keith mentioned, our, our conceptions of dating and um, archaeology in ancient China has really or, or with ancient Chinese objects has really, really changed. Within our lifetime. Within our, I was in Shanghai a few weeks ago. I was in the Shanghai Museum. I was looking at objects that were not from the north, not from the Yellow River. They were from the Yangtze. And cultures that I had never heard of, dates that went way back in time. So we're learning more and more all the time about this. So it's a really fascinating period, and I think some of your students might really enjoy um, doing some research on some of the objects in our collection using OpenFS and kind trying to put it into the broader context and doing some comparison and contrasting of the objects among and between even objects within our own collection. Absolutely. And actually, one of the, the teachers also asked another question that you both might be able to answer in just a few minutes. So sure. what kinds of questions would you ask students about these artifacts? So how would you do an artifact analysis with, with these types? Well, that's great because in this booklet, there's actually, there's actually a, in our teacher resource guide, there are actually lesson plans. But there's actually also what's called a data retrieval sheet. So it's a way of asking questions. There's many different ways of uh, thinking about the objects. Do you have any questions that you think would be a natural? Besides who made it, who may have owned it, how is it made, so on and so forth. Those, those basic questions. Yeah, I guess for me, and it probably says more about my own background and mm -hmm. interest mm -hmm. is um, a fundamental interest in how things are made. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you're looking at a final product mm -hmm. and helping someone understand, okay, if you wanted to have this thing, what would you have to do? What would you have <laughs> yeah. to do? Yeah. And I think that's endlessly fascinating with some of these objects. And by uh, asking leading questions about how something looks and how it's put together, it, it kind mm -hmm. of forces someone to look more closely at, at the yes. object in front of them. Are the legs Thank attached? You. Yeah. Or are they made with, with mm -hmm. the bucket? Mm -hmm. um, is this a stand with something put on it? Or is it one combined piece? Mm -hmm. Um, and looking at the grain steamer, because that's always a surprise for people that, oh, they had rice cookers in ancient China. Mm -hmm. Looking at the attributes mm -hmm. of that thing. Okay, you have a bucket with a perforated bottom and another bucket underneath it. What, what do you, how, what do you yeah. think it is? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what? So that's a great um, way of concluding. I just think that... Um, Using the object as the focus for the exploration is always a fantastic thing to do. And of course, there's no substitution for the real thing. If, if you can't bring your 
students here to Washington, D.C. to the Freer Gallery of Art and Arthur M. Sackler Gallery in person. Maybe in your communities you can look at some ancient Chinese objects. And if not, using that open FS, looking at the digitized objects, being able to look at them very closely by blowing them up uh, is, is a really good way of using the object as the starting point for the exploration. And I think that's uh, probably a good way of, of ending. You had to put a plug in for a peer institution. I think the Carnegie Mellon is in the process mm -hmm. of rethinking and reinstalling their galleries and uh, especially their Asian galleries. So I, I think there'll be a stronger representation of early China in the years ahead. In Pittsburgh. Great. Oh, wonderful. Well, a huge thank you to the Grable Foundation, as well as the Allegheny Intermediate Unit and the Senator John Hines History Center, um, as well as our colleagues Keith and Liz here, who just presented a fabulous hour of wonderful resources that we can use in the classroom. If you're not familiar on the Learning Lab, learninglab.si.edu, you can adapt pre-made collections to tailor them to your students' needs, or you can create your own from scratch using over 1.2 million resources from the Smithsonian's collections, which also include the Freer Sackler's digitized collections, which we saw today. Thanks so much for your participation, and we look forward to seeing what you create.